Okay, and now for this month's Spotlight Albums. Just kidding. <laughs> Greetings one and all, and welcome once again to Tom's Hit Parade. What do you say we do some backtracks today? How about that, huh? Yes, backtracks is my monthly roundup of notable album anniversaries divisible by five, with at least one spotlight album review. Sometimes two, occasionally three, but not four. Never again. Four was way too many. Anyway, let's go ahead and get started and uh, see what albums are celebrating anniversaries for the month of September 2019. Sixty years ago this month, Charles Mingus released Mingus A Um, his first album for the Columbia label. Several of its tracks pay tribute to fellow jazz luminaries including Jelly Roll for Jelly Roll Morton, Open Letter to Duke, a nod to Duke Ellington, and Goodbye Pork Pie Hat in honor of Lester Young. The album was added to the Library of Congress's National Recording Registry in 2003 and inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame in 2013. Also released in September of 1959 was the Marty Robbins album, Gunfighter Ballads and Trail Songs. Recorded in just one eight-hour session, the album peaked at number six on the U.S. Pop Albums chart and was certified gold by the RIAA in 1965. It includes Robbins' most successful single, El Paso, which topped both the country and pop singles charts and won a Grammy for Best Country and Western Recording. The album's popularity led Robbins to release a sequel, more Gunfighter Ballads and Trail Songs, the following year. September of 1964 saw the release of The Animals, self-titled U.S. debut album. Along with R&B standards such as Talkin' About You, originally by Ray Charles, Memphis, Tennessee by Chuck Berry, and I've Been Around by Fats Domino, the album includes their hit single and signature song, House of the Rising Sun. The album peaked at number 7 on the Billboard 200 out of 27 weeks on the chart, while the UK version of the album, with a slightly different track list, was released two months later and peaked at number 6 on the UK chart. Also released 55 years ago this month was Peggy Lee's album In the Name of Love. It spent six weeks on the Billboard album charts, reaching a peak position of number 97. Lou Levy arranged most of the album, with Dave Grusin, Lalo Schifrin, and Billy May taking turns on the remaining tracks. The album features her renditions of The Boy from Ipanema, There'll Be Some Changes Made, Talk To Me Baby, and Shangri-La. The title track reached number 132 on Billboard's Bubbling Under chart. Happy 50th anniversary this month to Abbey Road, the 11th album by The Beatles. It topped the album's charts in the US, the UK, and several other countries, and according to Wikipedia, is the 24th highest selling album of all time. The single Something was not only the first Beatles track not by Lennon and McCartney to be an A-side single, but it was the first such single to reach number one on the US charts. Popular album track Come Together was the flip side of the Something single. Another Harrison composition, Here Comes the Sun, was another popular track off the album. Although Let It Be was completed and released after Abbey Road, the Abbey Road recording sessions were the last attended by the band. Also released in September of 1969 was I Got Them Old Cosmic Blues Again Mama, Janis Joplin's first solo album after her departure from Big Brother and the Holding Company. This was also Joplin's only solo album released during her lifetime. The album peaked at number 5 on the Billboard Albums charts and was certified gold within two months of release. The single, Cosmic Blues, peaked at number 41 on the Billboard Singles charts. Other tracks on the album include Try Just a Little Bit Harder and covers of the Bee Gees' early single To Love Somebody and the Rogers and Hart song Little Girl Blue. 45 years ago this month, La Belle released their fourth album, Nightbirds. Produced by Ellen Toussaint and recorded in just two months, it was the group's most successful album, peaking at number 7 on the Billboard 200 chart and number 4 on the Billboard R&B albums chart, and eventually being certified platinum. The single Lady Marmalade topped the singles charts in the US, Canada, and the Netherlands, and was a top 20 hit in Italy, Belgium, New Zealand, and the UK. And it was also inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame in 2012. The follow-up single, What Can I Do For You, reached number 48 on the Billboard Singles Chart. The album was included on Rolling Stone's list of the 500 greatest albums of all time. September of 1974 also saw the release of Randy Newman's fourth album, Good Old Boys. It was his first album to reach the top 40 of the Billboard 200, peaking at number 36. By this point, socio-political and historical matter had become something of a trademark of his work. Rednecks addressed institutional racism and its connection to slavery, and Mr. President was an appeal to Richard Nixon to alleviate the effects of the then-current economic recession. Louisiana politician Huey Long serves as not only the subject of one song, but the lyric writer of another. That song, Every Man a King, features backing instrumentation by the Eagles, and the album's first single, Guilty, was recorded a year earlier by Bonnie Raitt. Speaking of the Eagles, this month marks the 40th anniversary of the release of The Long Run, the Eagles' sixth album. 
It spent eight weeks at number one on the Billboard Pop Albums chart and was certified platinum four months after release. It also topped the album's charts in Canada, Australia, Japan, and Sweden, and was a top ten album in five other countries. It yielded a U.S. number one single, Heartache Tonight, which also won the Grammy Award for Best Rock Performance by a Duo or Group with Vocals, and two top ten singles, I Can't Tell You Why and the title track. The album includes backing vocals by Jimmy Buffett on The Greeks Don't Want No Freaks and Bob Seger on Heartache Tonight. By the way, this was the Eagles' last album until Long Road Out of Eden was released 28 years later. Also released in September of 1979 was Gary Newman's solo debut album The Pleasure Principle. Abandoning the rock instrumentation established with his previous band, The Two-Way Army, this album saw Newman going in a completely synth-driven new wave direction. The album yielded the hit single Cars, which topped the singles charts in Canada and the UK, and was Newman's only top 40 single in the US, peaking at number 9 during its 17-week chart run. The follow-up single, Complex, went top 10 in the UK and Ireland. The album track, Metal, has been covered by artists such as Africa Bambata and Nine Inch Nails. In September of 1984, Billy Ocean released his fifth album, Suddenly. It was his commercial breakthrough, peaking at number 9 in the UK and the US, and reaching the top 20 in Australia, Canada, and Finland. It was also the album that featured his first singles to break the US top 40, racking up no fewer than three top 10 singles. Caribbean Queen reached number 1, Loverboy hit number 2, and the title track peaked at number 4. It also included a cover of Lennon and McCartney's The Long and Winding Road. The album was eventually certified double platinum in the U.S. Also released 35 years ago this month was David Bowie's 16th album, Tonight. It was the follow-up to his most successful album, Let's Dance, and topped the album's charts in the U.K. and the Netherlands. It went top 10 in 11 countries, but just missed the mark in the U.S., peaking at number 11. The single, Blue Jean, was a top 10 hit in the U.K., the U.S., and Norway, but subsequent singles fell short of that success. Loving the Alien barely cracked the U.K. top 20 at number 19. Tina Turner provided guest vocals on the title track, one of three songs on the album originally released by Iggy Pop, and Iggy himself would contribute guest vocals on the closing track, Dancing with the Big Boys. Three decades ago this month, Motley Crue released their fifth album, Dr. Feel Good. It was their best-selling album, and their only one thus far to top the Billboard 200 chart. It was a top ten album in seven countries, including the UK, Canada, and Australia. And it was their last album with lead vocalist Vince Neil for eight years. The single release of the title track reached number 6 on the Billboard Hot 100. Subsequent singles, Without You and Don't Go Away Mad, Just Go Away, went top 20. Robin Zander of Cheap Trick, Brian Adams, and Aerosmith's Steven Tyler contributed backing vocals on the album. And as a trivia note, Metallica drummer Lars Ulrich was so impressed with producer Bob Rock's work on the album that it led to a partnership that spanned 12 years and four Metallica albums. September of 1989 also saw the release of Janet Jackson's Rhythm Nation 1814, her fourth album. It was her second consecutive album to reach number one on the Billboard 200 and has been certified six times platinum. Among the nine Grammy nominations earned for the album were Best Female R&B Vocal Performance, Best Female Rock Vocal Performance, and the first nomination of any woman for Producer of the Year for Jackson herself. It was the, also the only album in the history of the Billboard Hot 100 chart to have seven singles peak within the top five, and the only one to generate number one hits in three separate calendar years. Miss You Much hit number one in 1989, Escapade and Black Cat both topped the chart in 1990, and Love Will Never Do Without You hit the top spot in 1991. All seven singles from the album also went top ten in Canada, with Escapade and Love Will Never Do both hitting number one. A quarter of a century ago, Blues Traveler released their fourth album, Four. An appropriate title, wouldn't you say? Their mainstream breakthrough, it peaked at number eight on the Billboard 200 and eventually earned six times platinum certification in the U.S. Its most successful single, Run Around, reached number eight on the Billboard Hot 100 and won a Grammy for Best Rock Performance by a Duo or Group. Run Around and the follow-up single, Hook, both reached the top 20 on the Billboard Modern Rock Tracks chart and the Billboard Mainstream Rock Tracks chart. Also released in September of 1994 was Monster, the ninth album by R.E.M. Despite being a departure from their established sound, dominated by grunge-like distorted guitars, the album topped the charts in eight countries, including the U.S., the U.K., New Zealand, and Canada, and went top ten in at least five other countries. The album currently enjoys quadruple platinum certification in the U.S. Its first three singles, What's the Frequency, Kenneth, Bang and Blame, and Strange Currencies, all went top ten on the Billboard Mainstream Rock Track charts, and top 20 on the Canadian and UK singles charts. Happy 20th anniversary this month to Mark Anthony's self-titled fourth album, his first English language album. It peaked at number eight on the album charts in the US, Australia, Canada, and Denmark, and reached number one in Norway and number five in New Zealand. 
It has since been certified triple platinum in the U.S. It featured the singles I Need to Know and You Sang to Me, both of which hit number one on the Billboard Latin Singles Chart, peaked in the top three of the Billboard Hot 100, and were top 20 singles in New Zealand, Austria, the Netherlands, and throughout Scandinavia. Both singles received Grammy nominations for Best Male Pop Vocal Performance. I Need to Know's Spanish version, Dimelo, won Latin Grammys for Song of the Year and Best Male Pop Vocal Performance. Also released in September of 1999 was Guster's third album, Lost and Gone Forever. Produced by Steve Lillywhite, it only reached number 169 on the Billboard 200, but I had to mention these guys. I've never mentioned them before in my channel, I don't think. Um, I've only got two of their albums. They're kind of like a folk rock, I guess is the best way to classify these guys. They play, pr it's pretty much rock music, but they use uh, acoustic instrumentation over, uh, uh, you know, electric instrumentation mostly. Uh, they're just, they've got kind of a laid back sort of sound if you want rock that's just kind of, you know, a bit more easygoing. These guys are great. Um, and I first discovered these guys actually by way of uh, the a cappella group at the local university, Univers University of Oregon. The a cappella group is named On the Rocks, and on one of their albums, they performed two of the songs off this album. So the you know the guys that were uh, running the group at that time, uh, so to speak, were big fans of these guys, and so I kind of became a, a fan of them by osmosis, I guess. I just they're one of the really undiscovered uh, treasures of rock music. Check out Guster if you've got time. Fifteen years ago this month, Arcade Fire released their debut album, Funeral. It reached the top 40 of the album charts in the UK, Norway, Ireland, and the band's native Canada, and although it didn't even break the top half of the Billboard 200, it earned gold certification by the RIAA, was critically acclaimed, and made the top 10 of several end-of-decade best-of lists, including Rolling Stone, Consequence of Sound, Pitchfork, and NME. The album was so named due to the fact that most of the band lost family members in the 16 months prior to the album's release, including Wynne and William Butler's grandfather, swing musician Alvino Ray, who had worked with notable singers including Dean Martin, Rosemary Clooney, and Elvis Presley. Also in September 2004 came Queen Latifah's fifth release, the Dana Owens album. It was an extreme departure from her established hip-hop sound, in this case consisting of jazz vocal renditions of popular songs from past decades by artists as varied as Bill Withers, Dinah Washington, Al Green, and Screamin' Jay Hawkins. It peaked at number 16 on the Billboard 200 and number 11 on the Billboard R&B and Hip-Hop Albums charts. It holds a gold certification in the U.S. and was nominated for a Grammy for Best Jazz Vocal Album in 2005. Herbie Hancock and Al Green himself both contribute their talents to the album. And can I just say, I think this is a very underrated album. I don't think it got nearly enough attention. First of all, Queen Latifah's got a fantastic singing voice, gorgeous. And also, I mean, I, I, I just like it when established artists step outside their comfort zones, kind of like uh, Lady Gaga did with her Tony Bennett team up a few years ago. And by the way, this was not the only album she released uh, in a jazz vocal style. She put out a second one, uh, Travel in Light. So check them both out. Happy 10th birthday this month to Paramore's third album, Brand New Eyes. It peaked at number two on the Billboard 200, was a number one album in Australia, New Zealand, and the UK, and reached the top ten in five other countries. The single, Ignorance, peaked at number seven on the Billboard Alternative Songs chart, number one on the UK Rock Singles chart, number ten in Belgium and Japan, and was a top 40 single in four other countries. Subsequent singles, Brick by Boring Brick and The Only Exception, both reached the top 40 in New Zealand. The album made the year-end lists of several publications, including Rock Sound, Kerrang!, and Alternative Press. Also released in September of 2009 was Mika's sophomore album, The Boy Who Knew Too Much. It peaked at number one in France, number four in the UK, number 14 in Canada, and number 19 in the US. The lead-off single, We Are Golden, was the album's most successful, peaking in the top 20 through most of Europe. Follow-up single, Rain, made the top 20 in Belgium, France, and Italy, but was Mika's first single to not make the UK top 40. Blame It on the Girls went number one in Japan and was a top 40 single in Belgium. Imogene Heap and the Andre Crouch Choir contributed supporting performances to the album. Five years ago this month, Kenny Chesney released his 15th album, The Big Revival. It was his 13th number one album on the Billboard Country Albums chart and his 10th consecutive album to peak in the top three of the Billboard 200. It racked up four number one singles on the Billboard Country Airplay chart, American Kids, Till It's Gone, Wild Child, and Save It For A Rainy Day. All of those singles, except Wild Child, hit the top spot on the Canadian country singles charts. American Kids landed in the top 40 of the Billboard Hot 100. Wild Child features Grace Potter on guest vocals. Bluegrass star Alison Krauss also contributes backing vocals on the album. 
September of 2014 also saw the release of Ryan Adams' self-titled 14th album. It peaked at number 4 on the Billboard 200 and topped the Billboard Rock Albums chart, Adams' highest peak on both charts up to that point. It was a top 10 album in the UK, Canada, Norway, and Australia. It was nominated for a Grammy for Best Rock Album. The single Gimme Something Good peaked at number 2 on the Billboard Adult Alternative Songs chart and earned a Grammy nomination for Best Rock Song. The follow-up single, Stay With Me, reached number 20. Johnny Depp and Mandy Moore both perform on the album. And now we have arrived at the Spotlight Albums portion of Backtracks once again. Uh, and yes, I am dialing it back considerably from last month. Yeah, no more four album Spotlight Months. That was just way too much. And I'm also being a little bit lazy with the picks this month. And they're going to be a little strange in general. I'll get, that, get to that in a second. But uh, yeah, I'm... Yeah, as you saw in the rundown uh, in this video up to now, there were quite a few really big albums to choose from, but, well, I was a little distracted this month for one thing. And on also, you know, sometimes it comes down to money, how much money I have to spend in a given month for uh, Backtrack Spotlight albums. And this first one technically should not be on this list. Let me explain here. 90% um, of my research I do on Wikipedia, and of course, since Wikipedia is edited by Flesh and Blood Humans, it's subject to Flesh and Blood Human Error. This album was on the September uh, breakdown of, you know, month by month breakdown of album releases for, uh, what's this case, 1984. So it is uh, 35 years old this month. And then uh, I wrote all the notes and got, you know, was ready to film this video this morning. And then I realized, looking closer on the album's, you know, the actual album's Wikipedia page, it was actually apparently released in July of 1984. So technically this album shouldn't be here, but I figured it's too late. I've got my notes written. This is the album I'm going to spotlight this month. If you don't like it, then... But anyway, let's get to the album. It is What About Me by Kenny Rogers. This is his 16th album, and it was released in... Okay, let's just say it was released in September of 1984, okay? It is 35 years old this month. Uh, it peaked at number 9 on the country album charts, uh, and it's been actually a year on the chart. Now, one thing really surprised me about this album, uh, it has much more of a pop sound than a country sound for uh, for Kenny Rogers stuff. And in fact, the closing track, Heart to Heart, sounds a lot like R&B. It, it has a, a, an 80s R&B sound to it, even. Uh, it was not one of his biggest sellers. It was not one of his more popular or critically acclaimed albums. Let's, let's put it that way. So, you know, it wasn't a fantastic album, but it was good. I enjoyed listening to it, and I'm not afraid to buy more Kenny Rogers albums in the future. But uh, yeah, this is, uh, as I said, it's a good album. Uh, there's a song on here called uh, Somebody Took My Love, which, I mean, that should have been a single. That's one of the songs that sticks out the most for me. It's just, I just really enjoy that song. Uh, the title track, What About Me, actually features James Ingram and Kim Carnes on backing vocals. That's, uh, that's the three of them right there. And Kim Carnes, I did not know this until doing my research for this album, Kim Carnes actually sung with him in a group called the New Christie Minstrels back in the early parts of their careers. So. How about that? You learn something new every day, right? And also, Richard Marks, who would of course become a uh, go on to become a pretty successful artist in the years to come, actually wrote or co-wrote three songs, I believe, on this album. Yeah, three songs, two of which, uh, including the title track and "Crazy," became his first number one hits as a co-writer. So, so yeah, the album does have some history to it. Uh, you know, if you kind of dig deep into music history, it's got some interesting. Uh, interesting going on going ons with it behind the scenes so uh but yeah a good album you know not one of my favorites uh, in terms of backtrack spotlight albums but uh, i enjoyed it i have to say but anyway on to the one legitimate backtracks album this month the one that actually was released in a september in this case september of 1969 so it is 50 years old this month it is the fifth album by vanilla fudge called rock and roll now if you're not familiar with vanilla fudge check them out they're they don't get a lot of attention, I don't think, anyway. I, I, you know, I don't see their name as nearly as much as Deep Purple or Yes or Led Zeppelin or Styx, which are, by the way, four bands that cite Vanilla Fudge as an influence. That, you know, that's the legacy of this band. They're they're not really well known by name, but by legacy, they're just they're they're up there. These guys have kind of a bluesy. It's kind of a, a blend of blues, psychedelic rock, and hard rock is kind of like they've, they've got this Hammond B3 organ in the mix that just gives it a nice chunky soulful bluesy kind of a sound to it and this is a great album by the way this is the first full album that I've uh, listened to by them I have one of their best of CDs and there were you know there, there were a couple things I didn't really know about this band until I dug in and did research uh, first of all was the influence that they had on uh, more well-known bands 
and also the fact that probably because, just because they were not as well known uh, as other bands, I just assumed that they were one of these bands that kept changing members regularly and, you know, like none or maybe one of the founding members was still with the group. But no, all but one of the original founding members of Vanilla Fudge are still with the band today. So, uh, but yeah, this, this is a great album. And another thing this band is known for is uh, extended um, uh, tracks. You know, in this case, for instance, uh, they do a cover of The Windmills of Your Mind. That's kind of an easy listening stable. And they drag it out into an eight minute and 52 second long uh, kind of a jam session, a rock, blues rock jam session. Uh, so, and, and that's one of the things that they do that I've, from the stuff that I've heard of them so far, is they take songs that aren't necessarily blues or rock and they turn them into, you know, these nice, you know, these thick jam session type of things. So, yet, yeah, you've got to check out Vanilla Fudge if you haven't yet. And this, by the way, was actually a, another thing I found out in doing my research. This was their last album for 15 years. And uh, they're still, they're not really recording much anymore, but they're still, I think they're still performing and, you know, touring and that kind of thing. But uh, yeah, a very good album by a very underrated and lesser-known band. I, I doubt a lot of you know who Vanilla Fudge are. So uh, as for this album, uh, yeah, it's like two of the songs are six minutes long, so that gives you an idea of how they drag out the album. And the album is only seven tracks uh, total. Uh, side two, I noticed, seems to be a bit more, or at least much more, actually, psychedelic than side one. Uh, Church Bells of St. Martin's is the first track on side two. It, it, sounds kind of weird to be honest uh, but you know it's it was the 60s so you know go figure and then uh, yeah as I said the nine minute quasi prog sort of a take on windmills of your mind that's that's actually one of the highlights it's you know a song that you wouldn't think would work in a blues rock arrangement but they turn it into something that's pretty pretty workable and uh, what's I think four of the songs I think are originals uh, uh, but three of them are covers and one of the covers is I Can't Make It Alone, which is a cover of a Jerry Goff and Carole King tune. So, uh, yeah, give this a try. Give this uh, band, or this album in particular, a try. It is going to make me seek out uh, more of their stuff, uh, particularly since uh, I think this is... They only did four albums, maybe five, uh, before, you know, up to and including this one. So they don't have a really, really huge discography to go through either. So, But yeah, Vanilla Fudge, Rock and Roll, an excellent album. And that is it for Backtracks for September 2019, and that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it, and I appreciate the feedback, whether about this video or anything on my channel, or about music in general. I'd love to hear from you in the comments section below. I invite you to subscribe to my channel as well, and check out my past videos to see what you might have missed. I'm also on Twitter, and you can find the link to my Twitter feed in the description below, so check it out and follow along. Also, please take the time to visit my friends and fellow YouTubers channels, which are also linked to in the description below. They're all great at what they do, and they're very much worth your attention. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time, and remember, life's too short to be a music snob.